would like to uh, welcome a Dr. Sonam Kiwalkar, who earned her medical degree in Pune, India. She completed her residence and chief residency in internal medicine at Rochester General Hospital in Rochester, New York. Uh, she completed a rheumatology fellowship at Oregon Health and Science University in Portland, Oregon, and she's a rheumatology consultant at the Vancouver Clinic and is the associate program director for Legacy Salmon Creek Internal Medicine Residency Program. Apart from that, she also uh, she's also pursuing a master's in education for health professionals at John Hopkins University. And in her spare time, Dr. Key Walker loves cooking and hiking around the Pacific Northwest with her husband and daughter. So Sonam will uh, today deliver the Ask Me Bites session with the title Tips and Tricks to Create Virtual Patients. And I will now uh, ask um, Sonam to start our, our session and welcome. And thank you so much for, for, for today. Uh, welcome everyone. I'm super excited um, about this session and thank you so much Asmi for giving me the chance to uh, talk about uh, the topic that I'm really passionate about, virtual patients. Um, and let me start by sharing my screen with you. Perfect. I hope everyone can see my screen. Um, so really the, um, the topic for today is tips and tricks to create virtual patients. Um, and I have been fortunate enough to be associated with the American College of Rheumatology um, with whom I am creating a virtual patient curriculum uh, for internal medicine and family medicine residents in the United States. Um, and this curriculum is directed towards residents. So we'll be teaching uh, fundamentals of rheumatology um, to residents across the US. So that really helped me to build my passion um, and uh, further look into virtual patients. Um, and um, going into disclosures, I have no disclosures. Um, today's outline would be talking about what are virtual patients to make sure we have our definition straight. Um, and then how can virtual patients be integrated in our medical curriculum? How can you support development of clinical reasoning using virtual patients? So we'll talk about principles of clinical reasoning and we'll also talk about 12 tips to support development of clinical reasoning using virtual patients. And what are the steps involved in development of virtual patients? And for the last topic here, we will be spending ample of time going into uh, some templates which will be available to you for development of your own virtual patients at your institutions. So with that, before starting, uh, maybe with a show of hands or uh, with a show of virtual hands, maybe tell me how many of you guys are located in Europe and how many of you are located in the US or other parts of the world. So let's start with Europe, actually. How many of you guys are um, located in Europe? Okay. Four, five. Perfect. And um, anyone in the US or Canada? Awesome. Great. And how about in Asia? Okay, we have a hand. I think I missed that. Okay, great. So we have people all across the globe and that's perfect. So thank you everyone for joining, that's awesome. Okay, so with that, let's start with what are virtual patients? Um, so virtual patient is a specific type of a computer program that simulates real life clinical scenarios where learners assume the role of healthcare providers to obtain a history, construct a physical exam, and make diagnostic and therapeutic decisions. It is a low fidelity simulation. How can virtual patients be used, right? So virtual patients could be used to develop core knowledge. It can be used for uh, the first or second year medical students to uh, you know, teach them basic sciences, for example. It could be used to teach 
patient safety, cultural competence, assessing learner progress. You can use it to teach evidence-based practice, clinical reasoning, quality improvement, communication skills. Now, it's, it's a bunch of things that you could always do with virtual patients, right? But for today's um, presentation purposes, we will narrow it down to clinical reasoning. The reason why I narrow it down to clinical reasoning is because that's the core of medicine, right? So when you want to teach medicine, you really want to give them the tools to learn about clinical reasoning so that with their core knowledge and their um, ability to clinical re clinically reason out uh, a patient's history and physical examination and put two and two together and then make a, the right diagnosis and therapeutic decision for the patient. So that's our goal, right? So that's why um, I think teaching clinical reasoning is very, very important to your um, students or residents or whoever you may teach. So how can virtual patients be integrated into your curriculum, right? It can be used as a supplement to didactics. It can be used as a supplement to clinical experiences, as an instructional tool for flipped classroom activities. It can be blended with high fidelity simulation, like use of mannequin, et cetera. So really you can see virtual patients can be integrated anywhere, anyhow you may please in your curriculum. Now, before we go ahead with the show of hands again, um, how many uh, of you folks are have heard about virtual patients or have used or uh, created virtual patients yourself? Just curious. Excellent, Kat. And who else do I have? Keith. Excellent, excellent. Vikesh. Awesome. That's that's great. That's great. Um, and um, are are all of you in um, in either medical school residency? You might want to type it in the chat uh, or unmute yourselves. That's perfectly fine. Okay, we have something in the chat. Medical school, excellent, excellent. That's great. Perfect, perfect, medical school, excellent. So I hope today's um, today's discussion will help you uh, either collaborate with each other or maybe uh, I, I can learn something from you guys or you can learn something from me. So it, uh, very excited about this, excellent. So the next thing is, how can you support development of clinical reasoning skills using virtual patients? So before we go into that, let's talk about principles of clinical reasoning, right? So the first aspect of clinical reasoning is hypothesis-directed data collection. So if you go into a patient's room, you know the chief complaint, don't haphazardly start asking different questions, right? Which don't make real sense towards the uh, chief complaint. So that is hypothesis data uh, driven collection. So collect and report history and physical examination in a hypothesis directed manner. That means you suspect something. If a patient comes in with joint pain, right? You're suspecting either osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis maybe. And that's how you're going to collect history. You're not going to collect history of suddenly of travels or maybe um, exposure to birds or something like that, right? So I'm just giving you an example. The next, the next aspect in clinical reasoning is problem representation. So once when you've gathered your history and physical examination, it is important to uh, compose all your finding using descriptive medical terminology or medical semantics, right? That is using acute versus chronic or using words like, um, say, uh, subacute or active versus not active, something like that. The next step is once you collect your history, physical examination and put the right uh, summary statement, you then have to prioritize your differential diagnosis, right? So that's also important in clinical reasoning. So you can prioritize it based on most likely, less likely, unlikely, can't miss diagnosis. Next comes, depending upon your differential diagnosis and how you have prioritized that, it will be what kind of testing or what kind of treatment you want to do, 
right? You don't want to miss the most likely diagnosis and you don't even want to miss the can't miss category of diagnosis, right? So you have to be very careful and order testing, but make sure you don't just order something for the sake of ordering, right? So high value testing is important part of clinical reasoning. And then metacognition is an important part of clinical reasoning as well, in which you demonstrate the ability to think about your own thinking. So these five aspects make up clinical reasoning. Now, the challenge is how are you going to incorporate these, um, uh, these uh, clusters of thinking or these principles of clinical reasoning to your virtual patients. And I will go over some of the examples here. So let's talk about hypothesis directed data collection. So for example, um, one of the ways that I love to show hypothesis uh, directed data collection is by a dialogue between the patient and the provider, okay? Um, so just a conversation, and this conversation really could teach your learners on asking open-ended questions or um, shared decision-making, or if you want to um, document something about, or if you want to um, teach your learners about, say, contraception discussion, right? Then you want to um, be aware of cultural um, uh, competencies as well. So you really can teach a lot of things with um, you know, hypothesis directed data collection. So that's one of the examples. Then you can also have um, teach them physical examination. So if you click on these um, green circles, you'll get more information about head and neck examination, say MSK examination, heart, lung exam. So this is one way that you could use virtual patients to teach your learners data collection. Next problem representation. So once when the learners have gone through your history and physical examination, you can challenge your learners to write down a summary statement, right? And then you could either um, go to the next page and say, well, this is your summary statement, which is great. And now look at this expert summary statement, right? And the learners can then compare uh, their summary statement and move on to the next slide. So that's another way how you can challenge your learners with virtual patients. And then uh, prioritizing diagnosis, right? So you can always use this Likert scale and you can put in the differential diagnosis and ask your learner, rate on a scale of one to five, one being most less least likely and five being most likely, right? What do you think the diagnosis is? Um, and then you can then go to the next page and say, you know, um, depending upon what uh, the expert feels, this is the, most likely diagnosis. And depending upon that, you may then challenge your learner to order a bunch of tests, right? Dra you can use drag and drop uh, and ask the patient to order what they want to order, for example. So these were a few examples. We definitely go into some more templates and tell you uh, how I like to create virtual patients and then would love uh, to hear about what you guys think. So with that, Let's now jump into some tips to support development of clinical reasoning skills using virtual patients. So what we saw until now was we uh, spoke about the principles of clinical reasoning. Then we, uh, using that backdrop, I then introduced some things that you could uh, put in your VPs um, to develop clinical reasoning for your learners, right? Um, and now these are just some tips taken um, through a really very good uh, journal article that was published in a medical teacher some time ago. I really love that article and um, the next three slides are really taken from that uh, journal article. So tip number one is use the history, examination, investigation, diagnosis, and therapy model to create VPs. So just like what you would do in real life, right? A patient comes to you with a chief complaint. 
you take history, you take examination, depending upon what clinical scenario you are in, right? Are you in uh, uh, ED? Are you in uh, a clinic? Or are you in a hospital? Um, it depends what your investigations will be. And then you arrive to a diagnosis and then you treat the patient. So create virtual patients really mimicking the real world is what I would suggest. That would help engage your learner. Use longitudinal cases. So especially um, when you have a learner rotating through, say, rheumatology only for, say, one or two weeks, and that happens all the time in the United States, um, how am I going to teach the learner long-term uh, case follow-up of rheumatoid arthritis, right? So virtual patients can be really a good platform to teach your learners about longitudinal uh, development, how the case unfolds longitudinally. So think about that. Um, always keep in mind your primary audience when you're creating virtual patients, right? You have to be specific and stage appropriate for learning objectives. You just can't go on teaching uh, things that might uh, be useful for a rheumatology consultant and not so much for a medical student or a, a resident. Always use direct links or hyperlinks in case narratives. That means if you um, want to uh, teach something beyond the scope of the learner, but you would feel if a person has an interest in, say, rheumatology, they would like to uh, you know, look at that particular topic in depth, then you can create a hyperlink or something known as educational loop where you can uh, ask the participant to click on that uh, loop and they move quickly from the loop back to the virtual patient. So you can make this loop seamless. And what I just told you, right? It should really parallel real clinic experiences. So what is the reason for the visit of the patient, history, review of systems, physical exam, order necessary laboratory tests, the opportunity to determine and then prioritize different diagnosis, and then therapy decisions and treatment plans based on uh, that. So, you know, you can always create virtual patients to be linear. What I mean by linear is there is only one path that a learner can take, right? If they answer something wrong and deviate from the path, you give them feedback, you give them gentle feedback and get them back to that linear unfolding of the case. This is one way how you could um, develop your virtual patient. The other way of developing your virtual patient is something known as branched narratives. That means if you start with, again, I'm going to uh, divert to my um, example of say hand pain. Um, if I start with hand pain and then uh, the learner thinks it is osteoarthritis, but not rheumatoid arthritis, and the actual answer is rheumatoid arthritis, you let the patient, you let the learner think it is osteoarthritis and go down that path. But then after treating the patient with, say, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, the patient is you know, after a few weeks, they come back saying that, hey, doc, I did not have any um, benefit of using NSAIDs and my disease is progressing. And then this way, the development of the case itself gives the learner feedback. And they again think about maybe have I missed rheumatoid arthritis, so on and so forth. So this is an example of branched narrative. So it could be either linear or branched narrative. You can always integrate summary statements, how I told you in the previous example. You can provide opportunities to practice medical semantics, that is some opposing words like acute, subacute, or chronic, um, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, you can focus on prioritizing and reprioritizing differential diagnoses. Uh, you can demonstrate patient-centered communication such as open-ended questioning, active listening, collaborative dialogue. Uh, you can provide continuous and immediate feedback to activities such as quizzes, multiple choice questions, drag and drop activities. And you can add take home points at the end of each case. So I have really bombarded you with a lot of information right now. So we started with what are virtual patients, how they can be embedded in a medical education curriculum. 
from there, we went on to just concentrate on clinical reasoning um, using virtual patients. And we saw what is clinical re uh, reasoning and how you could potentially incorporate clinical reasoning uh, using your own virtual patients. Um, really, the next uh, few slides are talking about the steps involved in development for your own virtual patients at your own institutions. I feel this is the most exciting part of the talk, but I will pause for a minute and take any questions that have already come. Um, Ka says, I am a fellow in medical education, excellent. Uh, I haven't created any virtual patients, but they are a part of a simulation suit we were using. That's great, Ka. Any other questions? Either unmute or just chat. Just want to make sure we are all on the same page before moving on. How to maximize, Harish says, how to maximize learner engagement and to stop them clicking through the end. Perfect. And we talk about some examples. This is an excellent question, Harish. Um, it's, it's very, very difficult to get um, learners to really go through the case, the case that you've put in so much effort into. So one piece that I have found out is if I want to teach uh, lupus, right? So I break the case, I break the topic into mini cases. I don't make long virtual patients. I just make a five minute or a maximum 10 minute virtual patient. And I have a lot of uh, slides where I want to engage my learner. For example, I make sure there are some hard stops where they have to stop thing and actually free type in text, even though I cannot really analyze the text at the end of the virtual patient, but it's okay. That helps with engagement. I think shorter virtual patients and higher number of open-ended questions, as well as giving them protected time to complete virtual patients rather than asking them to complete virtual patients at their own time, which then could lead to just clicking through the end, right? Awesome. Anything else? Okay, um, you know, we can always go back to the chat, but that's great. Great questions, everyone. Um, so moving on. Um, so what are the steps that I use when I create virtual patients? Okay, I initially start with creating a blueprint. Now we'll go through that blueprint in the next slide. But the blueprint really con contains understanding the goal of the whole curriculum, right? Um, and not just the virtual patient. What's the whole curriculum where my virtual patient is going to be embedded into? Who am I teaching? Who is my target audience? When I understand that, I then think about what are my learning objectives, right? Then I draft the outline of my virtual patient. Then I fill in the details, like what exact communication will happen between the provider and the patient, when exactly the labs will be ordered, when will the labs come back, um, what kind of feedback I want to give. So initially, I start preparing a Word document, right? I start with learning objectives. I name my virtual patient. Um, I think about demographics of the virtual patient, right? And this gives me a good solid outline. And then when I have a good outline, then I start filling in this Word document, embedding pictures, embedding uh, resources, everything in that rich Word document. Once when that is done, I use my PowerPoint templates, which I will be sharing with this group, as well as these templates will be available on ASME website for you to use. And then once that is done, I then create my virtual patients uh, using those virtual templates. Uh, I ask my peers to uh, review it, right? That is very, very important, making sure somebody reviews two or three reviewers going through your PowerPoint template. 
and depending upon your resources right if you do have resources in your academic institution you can always take help of an instructional designer who can put them into fancy programs that are utilized to construct these virtual patients the program that i use again i'm not endorsing any program but the program that i use is something known as articulate 360 storyline it is a great program it is very easy to learn very similar to powerpoint so if you don't have the resources of an instructional designer at your institution you might very well uh, learn the program yourself there are great youtube videos that could teach you those um and you know you can learn uh, the programming on on a weekend really it's it's not rocket science uh so once uh, you have created your virtual patient in the articulate 360 storyline or any software of your choice the very important step is beta testing your virtual patient making sure all the arrows work right because last you want the learners uh having lost interest in your virtual patients because they don't work right that will be awful and you want to beta test the virtual patients get your learners one or two people who are really interested in medical education to help you out with beta testing and then upload the virtual patients to your learning management system of your academic institution or you can host it online and then monitor learner metrics you can publish you can make a small uh you know abstract and present it uh, as a poster so it depends how you want to disseminate your uh scholarly activity so these are the steps that i take uh talking about the blueprint um again i want to make sure that the goal of the curriculum is is always in front of me when i'm creating my virtual patients i want to make sure who is the primary audience right and cater to your audience how will this virtual patient be embedded in the whole curriculum is it being uh, is this going to be done as a home assignment is it going to be done during the class uh, is it a blended learning tool how is my vp going to be used i think having that clear information is also necessary then the fun part you know name your virtual patient module um think about uh, what learning objective you want to fulfill use bloom's taxonomy when you're doing that and then outline of your virtual patient right what is the clinical setting what are the virtual patient demographics right you want them to be representative uh chief complaint salient points in history and physical examination that you don't want to miss and you want to teach must order investigations some evidence based treatment choices and then follow ups and reference all this should be in the outline of your virtual patient and once you have developed that you can then make this word document rich make sure you have all your pictures you have all your resources um your um references you have communication uh, between the patient and the provider uh, you can use different forms of communication right in the us we have something known as my chart that means the patient can actually um, text your doctor through the to the emr um, and the doctor or the nurse can then reply so you can have that kind of communication you can have a telephone communication so think about the different possibilities that you can make virtual patients more real life like you know if you order a cbc or a cmp or if you order a ana think about the delay when you are going to get results right don't give a ana result right away because that doesn't happen in real life practice so things like that so with that we are going to move on to the fun part templates to build in uh, for your virtual patients and before i share those with you let's go over the questions we are using branching and think link i think branching is great but if you are starting to create virtual patients for the first time i would highly advise you to keep your um, virtual cases linear uh, and as you get more proficient and more comfortable think about branching scenarios because definitely they they are great they are realistic but they require a lot of background work um, and a lot of time commitment but that's that's great how do you translate the score at the end of the uh i think virtual patient sim to gain clinical reasoning yeah that that's that's a great question um so i do this by 
two methods really one is um let's let's talk about a simpler method first it's self reported gains in clinical reasoning so there is actually a validated scale that i use to see how well clinical reasoning was uh, taught through my virtual patient and i will send you a link to that pre uh, pretty soon uh, it's a, it's a published scale um so but that's self reported right so that's one way the other way i use is a uh, pre and post test questions uh but these questions don't have to be just rote memory kind of questions right they need to be in depth because you are really assessing clinical reasoning so i use um something known as um case rich or material rich multiple choice questions that means um it's case based right it's not just uh, asking what is the sensitivity of ana no it is actually um trying to elicit a um it is trying to elicit your knowledge about a particular domain through a case based scenario right so if you can formulate those type of questions pre and post and then you can test them before and after using the module so that's one way a uh, third way is actually uh, the co the questions that you could integrate in your own virtual patients you can integrate them throughout and see how the learner has progressed and you can actually um score those uh tests that you have done throughout the module using articulate uh, storyline 360 i'm pretty sure you can even do those using other ways um using other modalities of uh, development of the virtual patient like other software programs but articulate 360 could also help you uh, um you know uh, translate the score at the end of your virtual patient sim so i hope ka it answers your question excellent um so with that let's move on to some templates okay so templates for history taking right so as i told you uh over here you could have the avatars of the patient and the provider and then you can really type in text here and type in text here so using these uh templates will be easier for your instructional designer it will be much lower cost than you just giving them a word document by itself right that will really really help them to um to focus on what you actually want so they can directly take these templates and import it into say storyline 360 and start developing it for you so the costs of this will be highly reduced or if you choose to learn um say articulate 360 by yourself it's very very simple to embed these powerpoint slides into your virtual patients okay so you have this or if you want a telephone encounter you could have that and you can always reduplicate the slides right and put in more of these templates this is another way you can show a patient provider conversation so back and forth conversation right this is yet another way my chart encounter um or a patient texting the doctor uh which doesn't sound fun uh through the emr is right over here so in these bubbles you can really put patient avatars or provider avatars and this is messaging back and forth so this is another way how you can show a uh, hypothesis driven data gathering some templates for physical examination now this is just an example of an avatar but you can have any kind of patient avatar over here and when um you click on this um uh, in more information you can have physical examination of the head and neck physical examination of the chest area abdomen area say musculoskeletal area and then again lower extremity right so you can use this template or you can use this template right where you can click and you can um uh show the learner what happens with that physical examination right templates for laboratory data really straightforward or you can show it this way um templates for history and physical so example you have this kind of template um and then you can just go through these and in uh, bullet point style you can have all your data over here or you can use this kind of patient file 
templates for timeline, right? So really you can use any of these templates to show how uh, there was the longitudinal development of say rheumatoid arthritis. It started with a, just a little bit of pain and swelling and now it has progressed to uh, deformities over years. And you can highlight that using, using these kind of templates. Then you can have flashcards, right? So these are templates for your flashcards. Some other sticky notes that you can fill in information, right? And you can add or delete any of these. These are some PowerPoint tabs to show some important things. Like if I want to um, talk about lupus rashes, right? So I can uh, have a picture embedded and talk, give a few sentences about lupus rashes. Click to reveal, right? Flashcards, really fun. So basically you click and then you reveal this uh, backside of your content. So you can have maybe a picture on this side and then click to reveal, and then you can have two or three sentences on the back. And then you can drag and drop, right? True and false. You can have a, a framework for clinical reasoning. Uh, you can ask the learner to type in, to engage the learner even more. What is the most likely, less likely, unlikely, and can't miss diagnoses. Um, and then you can have a question again in this bubble, you can put the avatar, you can type your question over here, multiple choice questions, true and false, and the Likert scale that I was telling you about. And then this is match the following. Drag and drop, drag and drop again, you know, you have this osteoarthritis hands, Heberdeen's and Bouchard's nodes. You can have take home points. And then the good thing about these templates, as I was saying, is you can directly import it into uh, any, any software to create virtual patients. Differential diagnoses, creating a problem list, right? You can have learners create their own problem list using semantic qualifiers. So once they build up a problem list, now they want to really uh, have the problem list in medical terminology, medical semantics. You can ask them to write a problem representation statement. Who is the patient? When did the patient arrive? Or what kind of uh, symptoms are they presenting with? So help the learner. This is called scaffolding, right? You can have this table of illness script for condition one, two, and three, which are your closed differential diagnosis, and either pre-fill the table with a few things or have the learner do it all, or just have it ready-made for your learner. So depending upon the level of your learner, you could decide how much you want to give away, right? And then just some, um, and these are again, you know, uh, got from the internet, but these are just uh, free source. So you can use them without any issue. Um, some of the icons that you might want to use. And these are some of my references. So anyways, with that, um, that was it from me. Um, I hope we at least introduced the topic of virtual patients and gave you some kind of templates to start with. Um, and then I was just discussing with Monica the other day to see if there are any kind of opportunities where we could create actual workshops over a few weeks uh, so that those interested could actually um, develop a small virtual case by themselves over a period of, say, four weeks. And um, we could have that workshop to those who are interested. So with that, thank you so much for listening to me. Um, and then I will hand it over back to Monica, see if you guys have any questions. Thank you so much, Sonam. This was really interesting. I'm sure that uh, everyone attending here will uh, take in a, a lot and it, this will be very helpful for everyone. I would like to ask if uh, there are any questions from our audience right now. You can um, unmute, you, raise, raise your hands first, please, and then we will ask you to unmute. Hi there. Um, thanks, uh, Sonam, for a great talk. It's really useful. Um, uh, just uh, wondering, wh which apps do you find are the most useful for creation of these? Because um, uh, I have to admit, I've, um, you know, uh, I've done Diploma of Medical Education before and... Wow. Uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, during that process, I kind of churned through lots and lots of educational 
apps and there's like hundreds and thousands out there. And sometimes um, you find yourself using up a lot of time to uh, test the qualities of the app itself rather than what yeah. what the content is that you're trying to create. So any tips on w- what you find are the most useful apps in, in this kind of virtual patient building situation? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. So I am kind of biased to one app um, or a p- computer program. Uh, it is called as, I'm going to write it down. Articulate Storyline 360. Okay. And Thank you. the good thing is it is um, about $499 for a year. Um, so it's it's something that you could get funding from through your department. Uh, because if it is less than $500 or less than $1,000, usually departments don't give any issues in reimbursing that much amount of um amount of money to you for a year and i think the license is great because with the license you get many access to many many templates you get access to uh these avatars that i'm talking about right they are of different demographics so um, which which really help you uh it gives access to this uh, society that people have formed um called as e-learning heroes which you can go to and um get some more uh, templates and there are a lot of conversations on how to create um, these uh, virtual patients. Uh, All is not directed towards medicine, but I think that's fine, right? Uh, People from all fields of life actually talk about ways to create these um, lots of interactive, interactive sessions and you can really pick and choose what you want to do and what you want to pick and choose. So I think these are two resources that are excellent. And I, as I said, you can learn this uh, Articulate 360 storyline on a weekend or something. And that's really what I want to do uh, if we can arrange a workshop at some time this year, um, you know, go over the virtual patient's idea and how you want to use these resources. And by the end of the month, you can really create a small virtual patient by yourself. So if we create this in groups, I think a lot of people could be empowered on how to do it, right? But that's that's an excellent question. So I am going to put in the link. Uh, It's actually, you can Google this, uh, but this is the reference for the validated questionnaire. Um, uh, It, yeah, the the article itself has the validated questionnaire and I think you need at least, that's kind of the drawback, but you at least need 150 participants or learners uh, to make sure that the instrument is valid and reliable. That is what they found out, but again, uh, it depends on your learners and stuff like that. But it's it's a great instrument. Okay, any other questions? Um, could I chip in with a question? Yes, yes thanks. Please. It's a really great conversation. So um, thanks for running this. I was interested in, in your experience, what some of the benefits are for different types of learners, particularly thinking around students with different learning differences or disabilities and how this might be beneficial for some of those particular students or or a hindrance. I'm interested in both, I suppose. Yeah, that, that's an excellent question. Um, now to uh, answer your second part of the question was uh, people, uh, you know, students with say learning disabilities. And the, the issue is at least in the US, I'm not sure how uh, as, as teachers or uh, faculty, we are not provided with the data of how many uh, people in your classroom are, say, maybe colorblind, right? Uh, Or may have some hearing impairments or something like that. So really, you have to be uh, very uh, knowledgeable about that or stick to some kind of standards when you're building virtual patients. And what I tend to do is always, if I have a back and forth communication, if I want to use some audio inbuilt into it, 
I highlighted on the screen that I, I will be using audio for that, but I always have some uh, transcripts at the bottom of the page. I never have an audio alone. So that's principle one. Principle two is making sure when you're using colors, um, use avoid that um, red, blue, green kind of spectrum. You want to avoid that or have some distinct, um, you, you don't want to ask your learner, pick everything that is blue, pick, pick everything that is red, right? Definitely you don't want to do that. So be, um, be very sensitive to those needs. So these are two things that I have come across in terms of learning disabilities. If you're talking about learning styles, really, that has come back, back again in medical literature saying that it's you know, it's, it doesn't have great evidence that you have to cater towards your learning, um, learner's learning style. Uh, because if you think about virtual patients, it's kind of an integration of, say, audio, visual, words, everything is mm -hmm. integrated. And that's what you want to uh, have your learner equipped with. So that theory is kind of uh, out of the window. But especially when it comes to levels of learners, make sure you create your virtual patient really geared towards them because a student will have it too overwhelming, right? They will think about the extraneous load will be so high of the virtual patient that the things that you want to teach them will be lost. So that's not a good idea. And if you uh, have a consultant or a resident or a fellow going through a very basic module, they are like, ah, this is just too basic for me and I'm just going to flip through. So having that adequate um, engagement, uh, making sure you cater it towards the learners and that comes back to learning objectives. Thank you. Yeah, great, great questions. That's awesome. Yeah, very important. Uh, Ka, please, you can uh, put your question. Yes, hello. Um, Hi. So I wanted to just to touch on what you said earlier about um, the material to be done during the, the students or learners' actual scheduled time rather, on, rather than at their own time, because I'm finding that if it's not mandatory or if it's not actually scheduled, there is very little uptake. Yeah. I agree. And I have noticed that hindrance as well. Uh, yeah, that, that's the best solution. But the problem is nowadays our curriculums are so heavy that it's very, very difficult. I mean, I, I feel for the medical students, right? We have all been in their place once upon a time. And it's so difficult to get even half an hour in your busy schedules to get this stuff done, even though you've put in your blood and sweat and tears into it. It's, it's just difficult for the learner to do that. Not, they, not that they don't want to do it or they absolutely have no interest. That's not the idea. The thing is, they just don't have time. And um, I think we have to be innovative and help them. First, the cases should be shorter. I'm a big advocate of that. And have some protected time, either after class, during class, uh, or, or use them as um, uh, in a flipped classroom method, right? Uh, have them do it on their own time, but then they're accountable for it when they come the next day, right? Yeah. Based on that, they have to solve questions. I, I like the flipped classroom. So the people I am I am um, talking about the VR, VR simulation are not students. Yeah. They're actually foundation doctors. So I'm in the UK. So foundation years are between medical school and specialty training. So there are two years of... Um, kind of general um, training where the doctors go into rotations. And the, I found that the flipped learning doesn't work for them, um, even though even though in theory it's good, but because they don't have time to get the time to do the preparatory material, they actually don't engage much in the teaching session. So any tips for that? <laughs> Not sure. Um, maybe a tip. And then if anybody else has any great ideas, I would love to hear that uh, for Ka's question. But one, just like problem, uh, team-based problem solving, right? So you don't ask them to do any kind of homework. Just get them to, to your class uh, and ask them to solve the virtual patient as a group in the class. And then uh, the virtual patient will be followed by a few questions and have them solve it either with interaction with you as the facilitator or just have them solve it in groups. So sometimes problem-based learning, um, instead of a, a paper-based case, you can have them solve a virtual patient-based case. I think that's that's one way to look at it. Yeah, I think teams are really good. Yeah. Teams are good. Yeah, thank you. 
And if anybody ha else has any other thoughts uh, for Ka's question, that would be great. Okay, it looks like we don't have uh, more questions for today. Uh, thank you so so much, Sonam. Um, this was really nice. And I would like to thank everyone who, who attended today. Thank you for joining us. As I mentioned before, a video of this session as well, any additional resources provided will be available in a few days on ASME's website. Um, we are currently accepting bite-sized proposals from our members. So if anyone here wishes, please get in touch with myself on events at asme.org.uk. And if you want to know uh, any more details about any events uh, organized by ASME, you uh, can go to our website to the events uh, section. So thank you so much, everyone. Uh, it was a, ple a pleasure to be here today. Um, and I hope to see you soon in another uh, session. Thank you.